Praise God. Good evening, church. I'm so glad to be with you again, Church of Praise. Uh, I think the last time I came was last year on a Saturday, and I'm glad to be with you uh, again. All of you look very good. Turn to your neighbor and say you look very good. Cheerful after the cheering just now, isn't it? You know, I met uh, your pastor and some of the others in Singapore during the GOS last month, and, and they, like, they never age. I don't know how your Malaysians do it. Never itch. Tell me the secret. Uh, somehow, when I stand here, I just feel very far from you. You feel that way? Oh, right. Is it okay? I come down. It's okay. Not too near. I know you all need some space. <laughs> praise God. Praise God. God is a good God, isn't He? I'd like to send you greetings from Eternal Life Assembly. I also want to send you greetings from my wife. She's here with me this time. Uh, but she will come later on for the Chinese service. And then tomorrow for the English service because she doesn't want to listen to me preach three times. You know, after all, we've been married 30 years. <laughs> Praise God. Uh, let us pray before we look into the Word of God. Father, we are so thankful to you for that you are here with us. We thank you even for the rain that refreshes the land. We thank you, Lord, that we are yours and you are ours. You are right here to bless us, speak into our lives, and we ask that the Holy Spirit will come and touch us in the innermost part of our, our being, that we may hear you, transform us, Lord, lift us up, we pray. For today, we want to see Jesus among us. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. You know, it's so wonderful uh, when I received the invitation. That was last year, I think, or early this year, I got, received the invitation about a month ago or, or maybe six weeks ago. I received what I'm supposed to preach on. And then you are in this series from the Gospel of John, right? October to December. And, and I love people who are serious about the Bible. How many of you are serious about the Bible? Raise your hands. I love people who are serious because the Bible is the Word of God and, and it's wonderful. And I learned that today's passage, this weekend's passage, comes from John chapter 16 uh, and 17. And the moment I read the email, one verse just popped up to me. By the way, uh, John 16 to 17 is Jesus' farewell discourse. Actually, his discourse, we can call it upper room discourse, stretches from chapter 13 where he washed the feet of his disciples, and then chapter 14, chapter 15, chapter 16, and chapter 17. So we are at the tail end on his farewell uh, sharing with his disciples. So this is a very intimate session. But right there, the verse that hit me the moment I read, okay, 16, 17, what should I preach on? There's so many things to preach on, right? Any passage. And the passage came, John chapter 16, verse 33. Many of you, if you are a believer, would know this verse. So we are going to try to memorize it. Wake your friend up now and say, it's time to memorize the verse. Okay, let's look at the verse. Okay? You okay? Okay, memory. Memory verses are not for children. I don't give you a star. But I think it's good for us to keep a verse. At least if you forget all that I say today, remember God's word. So let's begin. One, two, go. I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble. But take heart, I've overcome the world. Let's do that one more time. I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world, you will have trouble. But take heart, I have overcome the world. Let's do it one more time. I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world, you will have trouble. But take heart, I have overcome the world. Now blank the screen. Oh, good. John chapter 16, verse 33. Only three of you memorize this verse. Come on, we did three times already. Come on, be bold. It's okay to make mistakes. God love us. Amen? Okay, let's do it. One, two, three. I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble. But take heart, I have overcome the world. You're getting there. Not too bad, isn't it? Come on, let's do it again. I have told you. Okay, ready? One, two, go. I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world, you will have trouble. But take heart, 
I have overcome the world. Give yourself a hand, come on. Okay, remember this verse. Jesus says, I've told you these things so that in me, you may have what? Peace. In this world, you will have trouble. But take heart, I've overcome the world. Now, Jesus spoke these words to his disciples, like I say, to prepare them because that was the night he was going to be betrayed and the next day he's going to be crucified. So he was there in this very solemn, intimate, personal uh, discussion with them to prepare them for what is to come in the next few hours. And at this time, I just want you to just have a mindset about these disciples. They were on a high. Why? They had been with Jesus for about three to three and a half years. They've seen his miracles. They've been with the storm. They've seen him open the eyes of the blind. They've seen him multiply bread and raise the dead. They've seen so many miracles. They've been opposed, of course. But that week, that week called the Holy Week, uh, on the Sunday, Jesus came into Jerusalem on a donkey that was called the triumphal entry into Jerusalem. Everybody was cheering. You can see that the palm branches is Hosanna, Hosanna, blessings, the one who comes in the name of the Lord. They were on a high. In fact, just before this happened, they were arguing about who is going to sit on the right side or the left side of Jesus when he becomes what? King. They were thinking that Jesus is going to come into Jerusalem like a king and he's going to take control. He's going to defeat the enemy, the Romans. So they were on a high. And while they were on a high note, Jesus says, hey, in this world, you will have what? Turn to your neighbor and say, you will have trouble. You will have trouble in this world. He says, I'm going to die. You are going to have trouble. Uh, but you look at the verse again. There are three portions to this verse. He says, In me, you may have peace. A rain, a, a sense of well-being. In me, you will have peace. That, that, that peace, that just the shalom peace of God in the Old, Old Testament. You know, you, you just could sense that God is looking after your welfare. You're calm. Your heartbeat is normal. Your high blood pressure has gone down. You're just resting. Maybe with my voice, you will rest. And then usually people sleep when the preacher preaches. It's okay to sleep, by the way. It's okay. Just don't snore. You know why? Because when you snore, you wake up your neighbor. So just don't do that. But he says, in me, you may have the rain, eh? But he says, in this world, you will have trouble. But take heart. I've overcome the world. Peace doesn't really go with trouble, isn't it? And, and the Greek word for trouble actually comes from the word press together. Pressurized. How many of you feel pressurized? Stress. I recently I went for my uh, my my body checkup, and I I failed my treadmill, and I have to go to see a cardiologist. My blood pressure is a little bit higher, not because I'm preaching today. <laughs> Just went a bit higher, you know, and and the doctor was not happy about me. Because we live in a society that we're pressed together. It's talking about tribulation and persecution and affliction and, and distress and oppression. It says in this world, you are going to face that. But yet, in the midst of all this, when you are in me, in Jesus, in your Lord, in your Christ, when you are in me, though there may be trouble in this world, you have peace. So now turn to your neighbor and say, you have peace. Okay, we don't want to curse our neighbor, otherwise we start fighting over here. Okay, but let's look at this. And, and I believe in my heart that somebody here needs to hear this message today. Jesus began with the reality. And the reality is that in this world, everybody says this world. In this world. Are you in this world? Some of you are over the other side already sleeping. You know, in this world, he says, you will have trouble. What kind of trouble? Let's take a look at what he says in the beginning of this chapter. Chapter 16, verse 1 to 4. Let me read to you this verse. It's quite scary. So hold on tight to your seat. He says, I've told you these things so that you won't abandon your faith. For you will be expelled from the synagogues and a time is coming when those who kill you will think they are doing a holy service for God. 
This is because they've never known the Father or me. Yes, I'm telling you these things now so that when they happen, you will remember my warning. I didn't tell you earlier because I was going to be with you for a little while longer. You know, brothers and sisters, Jesus did not promise us a trouble-free life. He has not promised us a life of prosperity and ease and comfort. Maybe that blows your bubble a little bit, but Jesus didn't promise us this. He says, in this world, you will have trouble. Why? Because we live in a sinful, broken world. It's either we hurt people or people will hurt us. In fact, today when I was driving in, my wife just told me that, oh, there's bad news. I haven't heard that bad news yet, but she heard it first. And in the United States, someone went into an abortion clinic, into a clinic, and shot dead three persons. Some of you nodded because you heard about that. It's crazy. And I won't be surprised if the guy who killed those three uh, proclaimed himself to be a Christian, exercising the judgment of God on those who kill the innocent lives. It's a crazy world that we live in. And Jesus says in this verse, if you are not careful... If I didn't tell you about this, when these troubles come, when people seek you and hunt you and kill you and think that they're doing a good job, you will stumble. You will fall. You will feel scandalized. You will, what am I in for? Why did I follow Christ? It's worse than before. I thought all my troubles are gone, but hey, look, what's happening to me? I thought we always, always will be on the good side. You know, God will bless us in every way. Jesus says, no, in this world, you have trouble. And that's why I'm telling you first, because I don't want you to stumble. In fact, worse times are coming. You want, you want to hear more worse news, but we have two, because these are the words of God. You can go back and read Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 21. All these are Jesus' prophecies about the end times, and we are living in the end times. But let me just read you one passage, because I don't want to scare you so much, you want to leave church. Okay, that's the, that's the last thing we want you to do. Uh, so hear me out. Don't leave the church now. Okay, this is bad news. It's so the reality. Matthew chapter 24, verse 4 to 13. It's a bit small, uh, but you can get it. You can go back and read, read in your in your handphone or in your, in your Bible. It says, watch out that no one deceives you. For many will come in my name, claiming I'm the Christ, and will deceive many. Verse 6, you will hear of wars and rumors of wars, but see to it that you are not alarmed. Such things must happen but the end is still to come. Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning, just the beginning of birth pains. Then you'll be handed over to be persecuted and put to death. And you'll be hated by all nations because of me. At that time, many will turn away from the faith and will betray and hate each other. And many false prophets will appear and deceive many people. Because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold. But he who stands firm to the end will be safe. I'm not going to go through here. Today we're not talking about end time prophecy. We're not trying to scare the hell out of you. No, 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 no. But these are things that Jesus says will happen. I think if you look at the world, you can see them happening already, right? Wars and rumors of wars. I mean, they're not rumors, they're real wars. It started, I think, about two weeks ago when, we, when I read, I, I really was shocked because since 911, I've not heard this too much. But a uh, Russian jet, again, another jet was shot down. I'm so glad I drive over to JB. Now, these people are afraid to sit in a plane, really. Afraid to fly in a plane. I mean, the Russian, it's, it's a commercial jet. They're all tourists, was shot down, and then followed by. Uh, just last week or so, the Paris terrorist attack, isn't it? And I was shocked again. And how could anyone have these coordinated attacks and just go in? And since that day, since the terrorist attack, I think, I don't know about your government, but Singapore government is quite, quite on the alert. Everything is on high security. Everywhere. We are frightened. We don't know when is the next bomb going to come. Where the terrorists are, because they seem to be everywhere. And I think I read about in Malaysia here, they arrested some of these suspects who are supporting IS. This is real, brothers and sisters. These things are happening not in the future, but they're happening right now. 
in our midst. I think we face more restrictions. He's talking about the faith. More restrictions and oppositions about the Christian faith. I just received one video about one man who was just arrested and put in prison because of his faith in God. And there was another group praying for him and thank God he didn't die. They just put him in Siberia and, and just at the time, just let him freeze to death. But these are real. There is a day, I think in November, when the Open Doors Ministry were dedicated as the prayer for the persecuted church. People are still being put to death because of Christianity. Just now, before the service, I was talking to your pastor, Pastor Michael, and I said, wow, not bad. Your church got signboard outside, not bad, you know? Because the other church I read had their cross taken down. You still can have a cross. Praise God. My church doesn't have a cross anywhere because we're meeting in a conference center. It belongs to us, but we're not allowed to put any religious symbol outside or inside the church. Don't get stumbled if you come to my church. There's no cross. Restrictions. Opposition, but, but that might be, you know, a bit further away. I, I just read also the other day that Brunei, no Christmas, uh, public Christmas decoration or celebrations are allowed in Brunei. Since last year, they declared this. So if you go to Brunei, well, you just have to celebrate in your house. But closer home now. Is there anyone here have a trouble-free life? Really, you are the, be happy, don't worry, be happy. You know, every day you're just moving around. I don't think so. Anyone here stress-free? No anxiety? I think on Wednesday night, I woke up at 2 a.m. I couldn't sleep until 4 plus because there was a board meeting the next day. No, not because of that. It's because the year is ending and as pastors, we've got to prepare for end of the year and the beginning of the year. There's so many things to think about. No conflicts. I'm sure, I am sure I don't have to tell you anymore. Every person here has his or her own share of trouble because we live in a sinful world. Let me say it again. Either people will create trouble for us or we, though we are, look like saints down here, we do create trouble for people, don't we? I mean, as a pastor, I don't want to talk about all the trouble we have in church. But really, and I believe that every person, if you are growing, will go through some sort of serious trouble and serious pain, deep pain, sometime in their life. Because having trouble is part of this world. So Jesus says, in this world, you will have trouble. Not you may have trouble, you will have trouble. Are you already in trouble? Don't raise your hands, please. At the end of the service, we'll pray for you. But that's the reality. But the good news is this. is that Jesus says, in me, you can have what? Peace. You see, the amazing thing about Christianity is that it is not a bad news thing. People always say, why? I'm, I'm going to preach two weeks from now in my church. Uh, why does a God of grace send people to hell? You know, we always think that Christians talk about hell, judgment. This thing cannot do, this is wrong, and this is, and God will condemn you, and God will judge you. No, no, no. Christianity is about good news. Everybody says good news. Turn to your neighbor and say good news. Now turn to your neighbor, smile, and say good news. Good news. Trouble is not good news. But Jesus says in the next statement, He says, take heart. Take heart. Cheer up. Hey, look up. In this world, you have trouble, but take heart. There is a way out. I think I'm going to tell you some good news, why we can have good news in the midst of trouble. Number one is that by telling us in advance we have trouble, is an early warning. You know, in Singapore, there's a kind of plane called AWAC. I think it's Airborne Early Warning System. You know, and someone says that to be forewarned is to be what? Forearmed. He says, I'm telling you these things because I want to warn you. I mean, it's like today when I was driving in, I, I, I always listen to the news when I'm driving out of the country. They say there will be heavy rain in Malaysia. So I'm getting ready for, to take a boat back home. <laughs> it would be good if they can tell us that, isn't it? Why? Because when they warn us, what can we do? We can prepare. Weather forecasts are very important. And that's what Jesus says, right? 
In John chapter 1 verse, uh, John chapter 16 verse 1, he says, I've told you these things so that you won't abandon your faith. I'm telling you these things now so that when they happen, you will remember my warning. I'm warning you, I'm preparing you. And then, of course, in Matthew 24 verse 4 to 6, 4 and 6 says, Watch out that no one deceives you, but see to it you are not alarmed. Because these things must happen, but the end is still to come. So Jesus is giving us a warning. And if we have an early warning system, then we can prepare in advance. So I want to tell you, first of all, brothers and sisters, that you and I must prepare for trouble. If you're mistaken, if somebody tricked you, and say when you receive Jesus into your life and there's no more trouble and you just be you know, so happy, you, uh, you, uh, you, when you go for a lucky draw, you always win first prize. You know? Or when you go somewhere, you always get a car park. You know? When you go there, no queue. Everything soon, soon, you know, very nice. And then I think the person is not being truthful. Right? But if you are prepared, you see, Jesus gave us this warning to prepare us. So don't be caught by surprise when opposition comes. Don't be caught by surprise if you read some bad news and you are so fearful. Christians, brothers and sisters, never be fearful. Why? Because Jesus has already warned us. You understand what I'm trying to say? That is the first thing that must happen. So when something happens, when we get betrayed, we don't say, why like that? Huh? Why are people so cruel? Why Christians also behave like that? You know, last Sunday, I have one member told me this. She said she, she, was, she wanted to come to church, but before that, <coughs> she was helping out at a hospice, you know, uh, a volunteer. And one of the girls, younger, 19 years old, her parents were killed in an air crash. And this 19-year-old girl, uh, year, 19 year old girl was dying of leukemia in the hospice. But she has been visiting her and sharing hope and praying for her, you know. So she called her and said, can you come to the hospice this morning, on Sunday morning? So she had to skip church. She SMSed me and said, I can't come to church. Anyway, I came on Saturday, so I'm not coming on Sunday. I'm going to visit this girl. She was very happy when she SMSed me that. But the next day, she sent me a text. And she said, she is so down, so discouraged. Why? Because when she went into that room, there was not just this girl, there was her uncle and the auntie. You know, that means the, 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 the father's brother. And they berated her, they scolded her, they said, why do you uh, tell my, my niece to become a Christian? She will never be a Christian. My brother already said, we'll never change our faith. You get out and you never go and talk to her again. She was devastated. I, I have the SMS here, but I'm not going to read to you. She, I think one of the questions she said, I just went to share the gospel of Christianity. Did I do wrong? She asked this question. Did I do wrong? I wrote back to her. I said, you are walking in the footsteps of Jesus. You are walking in the footsteps of Jesus. I'm not trying to get you bad news, but I'm going to prepare you. You will face betrayal. You will face opposition. You have trouble. I, I, if I stand here and tell you all my troubles, uh, we won't end until tomorrow. So, you know, I'm just like you. Pastors are not, are not exempt from troubles. But we are prepared psychologically, emotionally, mentally. You understand what I'm saying? Jesus warns us, first of all, hey, you can have peace. Why? Because you are prepared already. You are not caught off guard. You know. But the second thing about this is that when these things happen, when Jesus says this thing, he's not predicting, he's actually giving a prophecy. That means God is in control. Everybody says what? God is in control. God is in control. God tells us these things before it's happened. Let's look at what happens after uh, this discourse. John chapter 16, verse 32, 32. Uh, I mean, still talking. He says, but the time is coming. Indeed, it's here now. When you'll be scattered, each one going his own way, leaving me alone. Yet, I'm not alone because the Father is with me. Did it happen? Yes. When Jesus was arrested, Matthew chapter 26, verse 56 says, then all the disciples, all the disciples deserted him and fled. 
even Peter who followed behind, he's quite brave already, follow behind. Don't scold him. He's quite brave. The others all got no guts, ran away already. But he followed behind. And what did he do? He denied Jesus three times. He says, no, I don't know this man. I don't know what he's talking about. The final one, he even swear. He says, no, I've never known this man. It happened. You see, I want to make a differentiation between prediction and prophecy. People can make prediction based on projection. What would probably happen? So I can predict tonight that after this service, many of you will go and have your dinner. That's a prediction, not prophecy. You know? And I can also predict that at the end of the Chinese service, your pastor will bring out me out for a good dinner. <laughs> that is not trying to force him. This is a prediction. But a prophecy is different. Jesus is not giving a prediction. He's giving a prophecy. A prophecy is something out of the foreknowledge of God. That's why I use the word omniscient and omnipotent. Omniscient simply means the all-knowing God. He has all knowledge. He knows what's going to happen. You believe that? You believe God knows what's happening? You believe God knows that it's going to rain today? I believe so. But He's also omnipotent. He's almighty. He is the one who sent the rain. He is always in control. But you see, when trouble comes to us, although we have the warning of Jesus, we always feel what? Out of control, isn't it? That's why we call it trouble. If we can control, it's no trouble. Trouble comes because we're out of control. But remember, God is never out of control. Nothing shocks God. It will shock us, but nothing shocks God. And sometimes we cannot understand why it happened, but God understands. God understands. He knows He is always in control. Later on, I will share what happened to me uh, three years ago, and then you can hear a little bit more about this. But I want us to realize that the Bible contains prophecies, not predictions. Prophecies, not prediction. Why? Because God is in control of the destiny of this world. And my brothers and sisters, I want you to know that God is in control of your destiny. My destiny. I like what we learn in GLS. One of the lessons is you are one relationship away. You may be one relationship away from changing your destiny. Right? I spoke that to one of my pastors. Because I just sense that God is changing her destiny. I'm not trying to get her out of my church. But I think God has a great, much greater plan for her. You may be one relationship away from your destiny, but the thing is that who controls my destiny? God controls my destiny. And I'm glad for that. You know, in my, in my family, my mother had cancer at about 80 years old. My eldest brother had cancer at about 60 plus. Then came my second brother. I don't know why they are like comp competing or something. Says, I also have cancer. So both of them got treated. And then when my brother, the second brother had cancer, my third brother said, I also got cancer. And then the SMS come. They call me Robert. Uh. Robert, you better check up. Be careful. You will probably have cancer. So guess what I did? I tell the cancer, I don't want you. <laughs> because it's not our genes that just control us. We still have a God who controls our genes. Amen? He's in control. So what if I really have cancer? Next year, I turn 60. Will the cancer come? I don't know. But I know what? God controls my life. Hallelujah. God controls my life. Nothing ever shocks God. He knows. That's why he says, take heart. Have courage. Cheer up. Come on. I'm in control. Don't worry so much. And the third good news is this. He says, take heart. I have overcome the world. Everybody says, overcome. Overcome. He says, I have overcome the world. Jesus has overcome and so can you. Amen. So can you. If your neighbor is sleeping, wake him up. This is the time. Write down, so can you. This is very important. Bad news, don't wake him up. Good news, wake him up. Jesus has overcome. So, so let's trace a little bit about this story because this is a Bible study, right? So must do a bit Bible. Huh? 
Okay? Okay, so, so immediately after this final discourse and his prayer in chapter 17, he prayed for the disciples. What happened? Do you know? No? Have you not been reading John? Of course, after this, he went out to the garden to pray, right? You all remember that? He prayed. And then while in the garden, what happened? Judas came with the soldiers. He was betrayed. There he was arrested. He was led to the courts. He was, he was given a mock trial. He was stripped. He was whipped. 39 stripes or maybe more. The Bible didn't really say it's 39 stripes. He was whipped. It was all bloody. And if you ever watch those shows like their passion and some of these uh, gospel movies, you see he was bloodily beaten up. And then finally, he has to carry the cross. And he couldn't even do it. He just went down under the weight of the cross. And somebody carried the cross. And there, he was nailed to the cross. And guess what, brothers and sisters? Jesus really died. Jesus really died. If you were a disciple, a night ago, you were on a spiritual high because you thought Jesus is going to be king. He had great authority. He chased out the people from the temple. Wow! He showed such might. But today, Jesus is dead on that cross. Lifeless. All their hopes, all their dreams, all their faith and their belief that He is the Messiah, the King, would dash. In Malay, we say, Habes, it's finished. No wonder they fled. No wonder they hiked. Because they knew the soldiers were coming after them now. Your master is dead, your rabbi is dead, your leader is dead, now it's your turn to die. The next day, Saturday, where is Jesus? Still dead. Still dead. No sign. Still dead. I don't know how, what went on in the minds of the disciple. It's gone. It's finished. And then comes Sunday. Then comes Sunday. No wonder Saturday you're so gloomy. Then comes Sunday. Up from the grave he arose. Amen. Praise the Lord. He is alive. He defeated death. That's why he says, take heart. I have overcome the world. Yes, things might be bad. Things might look hopeless. Everything is gone. But hey, look up. Because when you look at me, Jesus said, when you look at me, hey, look, even the greatest enemy of man, death, is defeated because I'm alive. That's why we can have courage. You see, the example of Jesus shows to us, proves to us, that no situation is a dead end. Do you know that? There's no dead end with God. We never know the end of a situation until we see God face to face. To us, it's a dead end. It's gone. It's finished. But praise God, the Bible says in Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 55 and 57, says if God, he says, oh, where all death is of victory, where all death is of sting. The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, He gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And then Romans says, if God is for us, who can be against us? You and I who follow Christ can proclaim with Paul. If God be for us, who can be against us? Even death could not hold our Lord Jesus in the grave. He arose. The situation is impossible. But I want to remind you that God specializes in mission impossible. Not the one you watch on a movie. That's fake. This is a movie. 
but God specializes in mission impossible. Jesus has conquered death. Nothing else can hold him back. Amen. Praise God. Why don't you give a clap to the Lord? Hallelujah. Praise you, Lord. Christ's victory over death assures us that he will bring us victoriously through our troubles. But I know, knowing one fact, I mean, many of you have been in church for a long time, many years already, knowing our fact and our response is quite different. You know, we know, we know, we know, but when trouble comes, what do we do? Panic, uh, fear, uh, call this one, call that one, uh, go here, go there, right? Not? We are like that, especially Chinese people. Very kiasu one. Really, really. I'm a Chinese, so I can talk about it, you know. We panic, we have anger, self-pity, and, and the favourite of Singaporean. You know the favourite of Singaporean when trouble comes? You know what they do? Complain. Complain, no? Complain, no? Right to the government, it's government's fault. Why is that the government's fault? Complain. Let me give you three practical steps before we close. What to do when trouble comes? This also comes from this passage. John chapter 16 and 17. The first thing Jesus says to us is that you are not alone. Now tap the person next to you and say, tap and say, you are not alone. You are not alone. You are not alone. Not because you are sitting next to the person, <laughs> but because the Holy Spirit stays with you. You are not alone. Did you hear what Jesus said in John chapter 16, verse 7? Let me read to you from the Amplified Bible. He says, However, I'm telling you nothing but the truth. When I say it is profitable, good, expedient, advantages. That's the meaning of profitable for you that I go away. Because if I do not go away, the comforter, and who's the comforter? The paraclete, the counselor, the helper, the advocate, the intercessor, the strengthener, the standby will not come to you into close fellowship with you. But if I go away, I will send this comforter, counselor, helper, advocate, intercessor, strengthener, standby. I will send him to you to be in close fellowship with you. Amen. We are not alone. How many of you know that the Holy Spirit is with you? Raise your hands. He's with you. Not for a visit. I come here for a visit tomorrow. I say goodbye and I go back. But the Holy Spirit comes to stay. Isn't that wonderful? He comes to stay, stay in our hearts. He says, when I go away, I don't leave you alone. Don't cry. Don't be worried. Take heart. I've overcome the world. More than that, I'm sending the counselor, the paraclete, the one who walked alongside us, the one who defends us. In fact, in another passage, he told them when you are arrested and you brought to the judges in the synagogue, don't worry because the Holy Spirit will teach you what to say. Isn't that wonderful? I tell you, I come here to preach a sweat, no? Every time I preach, you believe preachers, nervous or so, you believe that? People tell me, no lah, Pastor Lam, you always very confident one lah. Actually, not true lah. Sometimes I've got stomachache or so. But I've learned something from young. When I was a student, I came to know Christ when I was 11 years old. At the time, sharing the gospel is very scary. You know? Very scary. How to start? How to start? You know? But God taught me one lesson. That it is not I working alone. You understand? I can ask the Holy Spirit to help. Isn't that wonderful? You know, I see some of you are married, right? Married. Uh. I mean, sometimes we're all men. I uh, want to be macho. Uh. You know, a lot of things we want to do by ourselves. Uh. So you see this table already heavy, and we just want to carry. Oh, actually, our back ache already, jialat, you know. Actually, your wife can help you. Eh? Women are quite strong, am I right? Right now, women say amen if you are strong. Yeah, I think women are stronger than men sometimes. That's why they can give birth. We all give birth, we all die. Eh? But sometimes we are stupid, lah. we don't ask them, you know. Pray. Hey, I just wonder sometimes the Holy Spirit just say, hey, just... Share with me. Let me share the Lord. Come on, listen to me. I'm teaching you what to do. Why so stubborn? Just go in your own way. How many of you have the Holy Spirit? Come on, raise your hands. I have. That's why when I come here to preach, I realize that I don't need to be stressed. Because it's not just me talking to you. 
I was stressed even right here. And then God reminds me again, I can work through you. Let me bring the words to you. God can and He's real. Do you know the Holy Spirit? Holy Spirit uh, is not like Casper, the friendly ghost. Woo! Not like that. That's why if you have a word from the Lord, you don't have to, Oh, thou saves the Lord. No need, no need, no, no, no need. Weird, weird, not weird. The Holy Spirit is a very gentle one. That's why I put the picture just now was a dove, isn't it? Gentle. He speaks to us. When he spoke to Elijah, it was not in the earthquake, it was not in the wind, it was his gentle voice. You have the Holy Spirit. What trouble are you in now? Have you asked the Holy Spirit to help you? Have you asked the Holy Spirit to carry you when you're too weak to walk? Let him help you. He is, after all, the helper. He is the counsellor. He is the comforter. Not the one you put over yourself, but the comforter to strengthen you. Amen. So I, I want you to just, the first practical thing you can do is to say, Holy Spirit, please help me. I'm too weak to walk. I'm too weak to go on. Even if you can't pray, you know the Holy Spirit can pray through you, for you, and He's real. That's the first thing. Remember to lean on the Holy Spirit because He stays with you. The second practical thing you can do when trouble comes is this. It's also very nice. We can pray to our Heavenly Father. You can pray to your Heavenly Father. Why? Because He loves you so much. I like how Jesus turned everything around when He came to this earth. You know, in the Old Testament, when you come to God, you, you can't even come to God. You know, in some conservative churches, none of you can go up this place. You will be struck dead. Holy of holies. Don't play, play. But Jesus, when He came, when the disciples say, teach us to pray, and He, in a wonderful way, turned the image of God around and says, you begin in this way. Heavenly Father. Isn't it? Our Father in heaven. You know that term was never used in the Old Testament, no? No. When my children come to my office, and my children are quite big already. You know, my eldest is already married. I'm waiting for my grandchild next year. If you ask me, is she pregnant? No, not yet. But in faith, she will be pregnant. <laughs> my youngest, 19 years old, she just started university. and The second one is uh, 25. When they come to my office, especially the youngest one, not because she's youngest, but because she's young, you know, she comes up to my office, she doesn't have to ask permission to see the pastor. She just go into my room. If I'm not there, she go in, switch on the light, and sit on my chair. How dare she go to the senior pastor's room and sit on the chair? She can. Why? Why? Because she's my daughter. I'm her father. She can call me dad. No need to say Pastor Bob. No need. Do you know God is your father? Let's look at what Jesus says. These are wonderful words. Let's read that together. John 16, 23, 24. Let's begin. It says, At that time, you will need to ask me for anything. I tell you the truth. You will ask the Father directly, and He will grant your request because you use my name. You haven't done this before. Ask using my name, and you will receive, and you will have abundant joy. He says, ask who? Ask the Father. And what will He do? He will grant you. You will receive. Why? Because God wants you to have abundant joy. The Message Bible used the word, your joy will be a river overflowing its banks. Other version says that your joy may be complete full. Do you know we have a Father who loves us so much? He wants us to have a smile, not a frown. Do you know that God tears when you are crying? Do you know God's heart is so painful when He sees you in trouble? He does. Those who are parents will know, isn't it? When our children are in trouble, 
When my children were young, I disciplined them. I do, but of course, people say I'm so kind, I don't discipline. I do. I discipline my children. And sometimes even before I discipline them, they will cry. And then I will cry. Because I discipline loved. See, God loves us so much, so much more than you and I know. Would you pray to your Father in heaven, your Father, not my Father, your Father in heaven. Ask Him, because He wants you to be joyful. Three years ago, 2012, I was in Europe with my wife for a holiday, together with a group of people. And then towards the end, I think towards the last three, four days, I received a message from Pastor Elvin, the other pastor with me. And he says, your father-in-law is taken ill, pneumonia, he's in hospital. But you don't have to come back, the family didn't want us to tell you, but I tell you because we are very close friends. I told my wife about it, but because it was only three days away, before we fly back, we say, okay, let's wait. So we flew back. First thing we did when we landed was to go to the hospital and see my father-in-law. He's a believer, he comes to my church, I drive him to church on Sunday morning. We were there in the day. My wife would stay at night because she felt so bad she was away when she was taken. He was in intensive care in pneumonia. Just taken ill, he seldom go to the hospital. This is one of his rare occasions. No sickness in that sense. Just about a week later, we were, still, we were there in the morning. I still remember he was very weak already by then. And we were quite prepared for him to go, and he really died. God didn't answer our prayer. We only managed to spend one week with him, and he died. That was in June 2012, just before my birthday. Then in October, my sister-in-law, she was 60 plus, just early 60s, discovered with cancer. She had an operation. The year before, in December, and the doctor says, all clear, it's okay. But in October, she also died. She's a Christian. She was the wife of my eldest brother. And I can't take it anymore. You see, first my father died. Then my mother died. Then my brother-in-law died. Then my father-in-law died. Then my sister-in-law died. All Christians. I came out of the office because my brother says, you help me to do the first service. I said, I can't preach. Can I ask somebody else to preach? I'll take the service. And I walk, I still remember, I walk up and down my office and I ask God, I say, God, why? Why we pray and you never save them? Why do you take all the Christians away from my family first? Why are they the first to die? How am I going to face the non-Christians in my family? If we believe on Jesus, we die first. It's not so good a testimony. I ask God. I ask my father. And guess what? My father has a reply for me. He has a reply for me. Really, literally, as I was walking up and down. God says to me, He says, Son, listen carefully. Someday everyone will die. Right? It's a matter of time. But I choose to take away the Christians first. For one reason. Because when the Christians go, there is a funeral service for three nights or two nights. And in that service, all your non-Christian family members are forced to sit down and hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I say, God, I think you are wiser than me. Because I still remember when my mother died. I was so sad, my mother. She just celebrated her 80th birthday. She died. God was good to her. She lived longer than expected. But after she died, my brother came to us and says, I want to be a Christian. Take away the idols. My father died as a Christian. My mother was a non-Christian. But praise God, she became a Christian because at my father's funeral, she said to me, she said, wow, she called me Alok, you know, my name is Siulok. Alok, why you look so many flowers at your father? Wow, very grand. Eh? When I die, I also want something like that. Why so many flowers? Because I assistant soup, what? All the churches send, uh, you know. And when she died, God like that, uh, Christine. Uh. I 
couldn't understand when it happened. But God has an answer, and I was comforted. If not, I believe I would fall into depression and discouragement. I'd say, no use, isn't it? What kind of testimony? But I thank God that God is wiser than us. Talk to your father. Talk to your father. He has an answer when he has no answers. And the third, the third thing that we have, practically, is to share with fellow believers. You see, Jesus prayed a prayer in John chapter 17. John chapter 17, verse 21, he says, I pray that they will, be all, they will all be one, just as you and I are one. As you are in me, Father, and I'm in you, and may they be in us so that the world will believe you sent me. He pray that we are one. Galatians chapter 6 says, carry each other's burdens, and then you will fulfill the law of Christ. You know, when he says you are one, doesn't mean you have to be a member of Church of Praise. I feel one with you. I come from Eternal Life Assembly, in case you didn't catch that just now. But we are one in the Lord. I can call him Brother Michael. He can call me Brother Bob. No need to have all the chen fu, chen fu, you know. We are. If he has a burden you want to share with me, I will share that burden. If I have a burden I feel I want to share with him, I can share with him. We are. That is the prayer, that last prayer of Jesus was that you and I will be one. Isn't that the new command? He says, love one another as I have loved you. But you see, more than that, I want you brothers and sisters to hear clearly. He says that they may be one so that the world will believe you sent me. Do you know our oneness, our unity, our love for one another is a testimony to Jesus Christ. My mother came to know Christ. One of the reasons... She's, she's adamant that she wouldn't come to know Christ. She's very faithful to their, her gods because my father already betrayed the gods. So she must be faithful, right? Somebody in the family got to, got to be faithful. So she told me, I won't, I won't be a Christian. Finally, when she became a Christian, we baptized her. I asked her some questions. Why she became a Christian? She told me various things. Just quickly, I'll tell you. One of the things was, she said, why? I counted how many times I go to the hospital. I thought I wouldn't come out. Then I came out. Your God uh, is real. And when she, just before 80th birthday, she was diagnosed with pan pancreatic cancer, one of the most deadly cancer. My elder brother, who's not a Christian, you know, the second brother, tell her, don't celebrate. Lah. You won't make it. Because doctors give her three months. You won't make it. I told her, I said, Mom, I will go with you to the hotel and book. You will make it. And she celebrated her 8th year birthday. She saw the marriage of her, of her grandson. She saw the marriage of her granddaughter. She count all these things and she said, you see, your God helped me to celebrate. And she celebrated Chinese New Year too. But one of the things that touches her heart was this. She said, when I had cancer, even our relatives didn't come. But your members came. The love of the saints. And so I want to tell you, if you have in trouble, when you're in trouble, share with somebody. Don't feel paise, don't feel embarrassed. We are what? Family. And we are eternal family. You can always find a family everywhere you go. And this family will carry the burden for you. I'm going to end now. Time is passing us so quickly. But I want us to recite again John chapter 16, verse 33. Can we all stand and recite this verse? You don't even need to look at the screen. You all know this verse now, by now. Right? Let's begin. One, two, three. I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble. But take heart. I have overcome the world. Let's do it one more time. I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world, you will have trouble, but take heart, I've overcome the world. You know, brothers and sisters, you can have peace in times of trouble because God gives us His peace. He's with us. You can. The Holy Spirit is with you. God knows nothing is outside His control. He is always the one who is above all. I want you to bow your heads and close your eyes.